consider the statement, quote, we should only believe what can be scientifically proven, end quote. Can that statement be scientifically proven? Well, obviously not. And thus the scientific naturalist's position refutes itself, and so it cannot be true. But um, do you deny that science cannot account for everything? Yes, I do deny that science So what can't it account for? Well, I, had you brought that up in the debate, I had a number of examples that I was going to give. Uh, I think there are a good number of things that cannot be scientifically proven, but that we're all rational to accept. Let, so, me, list, let me list five. Logical and mathematical truths cannot be proven by science. Science presupposes logic and math, so that to try to prove them by science would be arguing in a circle. Uh, metaphysical truths, like there are other minds other than my own, or that the external world is real, or that the past was not created five minutes ago with an appearance of age, are rational beliefs that cannot be scientifically proven. Ethical beliefs about statements of value uh, are not accessible by the scientific method. You can't show by science whether the Nazi scientists in the camps did anything evil as opposed to the scientists in Western democracies. Aesthetic judgments, number four, cannot be accessed by the scientific method because the beautiful, like the good, cannot be scientifically proven. And finally, most remarkably, would be science itself. Science cannot be justified by the scientific method. Science is permeated with um, unprovable assumptions. For example, in the special theory of relativity, the whole theory hinges on the assumption that the speed of light is constant in a one-way direction between any two points A and B. But that strictly cannot be proven. We simply have to assume that in order to hold to the theory. But you're missing the whole... So put that in your pipe and smoke it. Yeah, all right. Okay. Yeah. So okay. we are, none of these beliefs can be scientifically proven, and yet they are accepted by all of us, and we're rational in doing so. Okay. Years ago, I was speaking at an evangelistic event in Baltimore, Maryland, and I was told that there was a very vicious atheist uh, who was a, had his PhD from Johns Hopkins University and been an engineer for 30 years, really hated Christianity, and a person was going to bring his boss uh, to this little evangelistic gathering where I was going to be sharing my faith. Well, I was at the hors d'oeuvre table before the event got going, and I saw this gentleman walk in the door with his boss, and sure enough, they made a beeline to the hors d'oeuvre table, and uh, this, this uh, friend of mine introduced me to this gentleman, and no sooner did we exchange pleasantries when he said, well, I understand that you're a philosopher and a theologian, and I said, well, I give it my best shot. <laughs> and he said, yeah, he said, I used to be interested in that myself when I was a teenager, but I've outgrown it now because I realize now that if you can't test it and quantify your data and measure it in the laboratory, it's nothing but a bunch of idle speculation and hot air. You ever heard anybody express that attitude? A lot of people have that attitude. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. Well, I let him go for about another two minutes. And then I interrupted him and said, excuse me, but uh, I have a question. I'm a little bit puzzled. If I understand you correctly, if you can't quantify something in the lab and test it scientifically, then the assertion is nothing but idle speculation of a bunch of hot air. And he said, that's absolutely right. He said, I've believed this for a long time. And I said, well, you've said 30 or 40 sentences uh, that have come out of your mouth in the last two minutes. And of the 30 or 40 things you've said, I can't think of a single thing that can be tested scientifically. I said, if I'm wrong, would you show me which statement you've made that is scientifically testable? But if I'm right, do you see my dilemma? What you've been saying for the last two minutes is nothing but a bunch of <laughs> Well, he changed the subject very quickly. But, but the point is that when people tell you that science is the only way we can know things or it's the only thing that's true, uh, that statement can't be true and it can't be known to be true. And so statements like this are false. Science, ladies and gentlemen, is a wonderful gift from God, and I'll say that before I close again. But it is only one way of knowing reality. It's important, but there are many ways to know reality outside of science. And the statement that science is the only way we can know reality is not itself something that can be known by science. 
and it is a self-refuting claim. Can faith and reason work together, or are they somehow mutually exclusive? What role do facts and evidence play when it comes to the Christian faith? This is Reasonable Faith, Conversations with Dr. William Lane Craig. I'm Kevin Harris, and on behalf of Dr. Craig, I want to welcome you to this discussion as Dr. Craig examines apologetics, reason, faith, and philosophy. Philosophy. Now that is a fascinating field. Bill, everybody has a philosophy, it seems, a philosophy of life. I think that's right, Kevin. We all live according to a certain worldview, which involves a commitment to what we take to be the ultimate reality, um, whether or not we think there are objective moral values that we guide our lives by, what is the meaning of life. And the person who claims not to have a philosophy is the person who's most apt to have simply absorbed one unawares and to subconsciously be living according to a certain philosophy that he isn't even aware of. So the question isn't really whether we're going to be philosophers. The question will be whether or not we're going to be good ones. And rather self-refuting to say, my philosophy is that I don't need philosophy. <laughs> right. <laughs> because you've uttered a philosophy at that point. Right. Well... The Bible actually addresses philosophy. Paul does in Colossians chapter 2, and in verse 8 he says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ. Now, there have been some rather negative interpretations of that scripture, and, and some uh, believers in the church avoid philosophy because of that verse. Well, it is rather sobering when you think that the only place that philosophy is mentioned in the New Testament is in the context of a warning, that this is something to beware of. But I like the translation you read because it made it clear that Paul's talking about a certain kind of philosophy. He says to beware of hollow and deceitful philosophy according to human tradition and not according to Christ. And I certainly agree with that, that a, a godless secular philosophy of life is something that can be very destructive and is something to be on one's alert for. But fortunately, philosophy doesn't have to be like that. There can be philosophy, which is according to Christ, and that can be something that honors God, that helps us to more deeply understand our faith, and can help us to defend our faith in the public marketplace of ideas. Even a philosopher who is not a Christian or doesn't believe in God, when that philosopher recognizes truth, they're recognizing God's truth. Right. My former philosophy professor at Wheaton College, Arthur Holmes, was fond of saying that all truth is God's truth. And I think that's correct. Regardless of who un understands it or who discovers it or enunciates it, that person has had a glimpse of God's truth, truth that is known to God and which belongs to him. And so the source is, in a sense, irrelevant. All truth is God's truth. The danger, though, in reading godless or secular philosophy is that there's apt to be a large admixture of error in with the truth. And that can lead one astray and be destructive. And that's why Paul warns against this kind of philosophy which is according to human tradition and not according to Christ. Bill, when I read this verse, it tells us to beware of this kind of philosophy. It occurs to me that we cannot beware of what we are not aware. It's almost as if we need to be aware of what the arguments are well, that's so that we can point, counteract yes. them, perhaps. That, that's a good point. I, I, in my own life, take this warning to heart. I try to beware, but that doesn't mean I'm unaware of it or in blissful ignorance. I study these men and their writings. I try to discern where the fallacies lie, and I submit my reason and my work as a philosopher to the authority of Holy Scripture. But as you say, obeying the command to beware of something isn't inconsistent with being aware of that same thing. That makes sense. And when we go to Acts 17, we see that Paul was very philosophical when he stood before the philosophers there on Mars Hill. Right. He encountered Epicurean, 
and Stoic philosophers in Athens and proclaim to them the creator God of the universe who's revealed himself through Jesus of Nazareth by raising him from the dead. So Paul was certainly a, a person who was not afraid to interact with the thinkers of his day. It would probably be helpful just to define philosophy. Philosophy literally exegeted means the love of wisdom, but more specifically, it's a discipline, an academic discipline, that explores the foundations of every other discipline at the university. It asks questions about metaphysics, for example, what is the nature of ultimate reality? What is the nature of human being? It asks ethical questions like the nature of objective values and duties. It asks questions of epistemology, which is the theory of knowledge. How do we know what we know? And is there truth? What's the nature of truth? And how do we discover truth? Aesthetics is a branch of philosophy which deals with the beautiful and whether or not there are objective distinctions between beauty and ugliness. So philosophy explores all of these very deep questions about the nature of reality and the world in which we live. Well, we as Christians are told over and over and over to seek wisdom, and the Proverbs are, are full of wisdom. Surely this would be something that we would fall into naturally. I think so. Paul says that in Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so we have the tremendous privilege of having a revelation from God in Scripture that tells us the answer to some of these most basic questions of life. But then it doesn't give us all the answers. It leaves it up to us to rationally reflect upon the data revealed in Scripture and to seek to formulate a Christian world and life view. And that's one of the projects that a Christian intellectual will be about, will be trying to formulate what's called a Weltanschauung, a, a world and life view from a Christian perspective, a Christian view of literature, of history, of the arts, of science, and so forth. And the, one of the great privileges of being in Christian uh, academics is being able to explore all of these various interesting questions from the standpoint of Christian truth and trying to develop a Christian perspective on these things. How do logic and philosophy interact? Well, logic is also a branch of philosophy that seeks to explore the rules of correct reasoning. There are really only about nine basic rules of logic that you have to learn in order to reason correctly from premises to a conclusion. And most of us employ these rules all the time unconsciously in everyday life. But in logic, these rules are rendered explicit. One learns how to then formulate arguments, uh, test them by these rules of inference, and then discern fallacies. And there are different kinds of logic for various kinds of statements. For example, modal logic deals with the logic of possibility and necessity. Counterfactual logic deals with the logic of conditional statements in the subjunctive mood, like if I were rich, I would buy a Mercedes. And so the field of logic is a very rich field of philosophical inquiry. It's, it's somewhat akin to mathematics, really. Pure logic is very much like mathematics. Bill, if there's a certain philosophy that dominates the universities of a country, that really has an effect on culture, doesn't it? Trickles down, perhaps? I think that's correct. The, the university is the single most important cultural institution shaping Western society. And because the university is so deeply secularized, the society shaped by that university will be secularized. And because the university is the place at which our future political leaders, our future businessmen, our future scientists, our future judges and lawyers, our future artists will be trained, it is vitally important that the Christian world and life view have a place of respect at the university so that we can help to shape culture by means of those who influence culture. And therefore, I'm deeply committed to working with university-age students and with faculty as well to see that the Christian world and life view has a place at the table in the conversations that are going on at the university. Do you have some suggestions as to what we should read if we want to begin to 
increase our philosophical prowess or knowledge, including some of your own resources? J.P. Moreland and I have recently written a book called Philosophical Foundations for a Christian Worldview, published by InterVarsity Press. And this is a book that is a very wide-ranging introduction to the different fields of philosophy from an explicitly Christian point of view. So we look at things like philosophy of science and metaphysics and epistemology and philosophy of religion from the standpoint of a Christian world and life view and seek to enunciate some positions with regard to these ultimate questions. So that would be a resource I think that folks might find helpful if they have some familiarity with these issues already. It's not a a beginner's text, but it's a text for those who are already engaged in thinking about some of these issues seriously. We should love God with all our minds. We're commanded to love God with all of our minds as well as all of our strength and soul and might. And therefore, part of Christian discipleship, part of reaching Christian maturity is the discipleship of the mind. I've taken as a sort of theme verse for my ministry what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. There Paul says, we destroy arguments and every proud obstacle to the knowledge of God, taking every thought captive to obey Christ. For more resources on this and many other topics from Dr. William Lane Craig, visit online to reasonablefaith.org. That's reasonablefaith.org. Can faith and reason work together, or are they somehow mutually exclusive? What role do facts and evidence play when it comes to the Christian faith? This is Reasonable Faith, Conversations with Dr. William Lane Craig. I'm Kevin Harris, and on behalf of Dr. Craig, I want to welcome you to this discussion as Dr. Craig examines apologetics, reason, faith, and philosophy. Dr. Craig, as a philosopher working in the university, you've seen somewhat of a renaissance of Christian philosophy these days. Yes, I've been privileged to witness this happen before my very eyes. When I first began to study philosophy back in the 1970s, there were very few prominent Christian philosophers. When I wanted to do my doctorate in philosophy, writing on arguments for the existence of God, I felt that I had to go to Great Britain to find someone who would be a sympathetic doctoral mentor to supervise my dissertation on the cosmological argument. But today, Christian philosophy is everywhere at the university, and at our finest secular universities, you will find Christian philosophers in those departments uh, doing good work and being a bold witness for Christ. It's just a remarkable transformation that's taken place in Anglo-American philosophy over the last 40 years. Besides yourself, who are some of these philosophers? Some of the most important would be people like Alvin Plantinga, who is a professor of philosophy at the University of Notre Dame. He comes out of the Dutch Reformed tradition. He was for many years at Calvin College, but then moved to Notre Dame to found a PhD program in Christian philosophy. And he's assembled a remarkable cadre of Christian philosophers at Notre Dame. For example, Peter Van Inwagen, a very prominent metaphysician, is there. Thomas Flint and Alfred Fredoso, two excellent philosophers. Fredoso, a medieval specialist. Thomas Flint, doing very good work in divine foreknowledge and human freedom. In addition to those philosophers, people like Eleanor Stump at St. Louis University, George Mavrodis, recently retired from the University of Western Michigan, William Alston, a very prominent American philosopher, recently retired, was at the University of Syracuse for many years and has had a great influence. He came to Christ late in life, and his conversion was rather dramatic story. Uh, Dallas Willard out at USC in California, and uh, just many, many others all across the country and in England as well, people like Richard Swinburne at Oxford University and now uh, Bob and Marilyn Adams recently moved from Yale to Oxford University and Brian Leftow, an American philosopher, a, a Jewish 
fellow who became a Christian uh, and is now at Oxford. So just a tremendous, tremendous renaissance that's taking place in this discipline. And they are influential in that they are respected by their secular peers and read by their secular peers. Exactly. These people that I've mentioned are not obscure figures. These are people who are publishing in the first-rate journals. They are publishing works with the finest academic presses like Oxford University Press, Cambridge University Press, and uh, Cornell University Press, and so forth. These are philosophers who are, whose work is absolutely top drawer and will often be the presidents of professional philosophical organizations like the American Philosophical Association and other societies. So it's really amazing. I think one of the best evidences of this change was an article that appeared in the fall issue of 2001 in the secular humanist journal Philo by my friend and atheist philosopher colleague Quentin Smith from the University of Western Michigan. And in this article, Smith laments what he calls the desecularization of academia that is taking place at the American University today, particularly in philosophy departments. And he describes how over the last 40 years, naturalists stood by passively and watched as more and more Christians began to enter into the field of philosophy and do absolutely first-rate work that could not be ignored. And he describes how philosophy has become a favorite point of entry now for some of the brightest young minds entering the university today. And he estimates in his article that he thinks between one quarter to one third of American faculty in philosophy are now theists, and most of them born again Christians. Now, even if that's an exaggeration of the numbers, I think it gives you a feel for the impact, the perceived impact of this revolution that's been going on in American philosophy. Like Gideon's Army, a minority of committed activists can have an impact upon a discipline that far exceeds their actual numbers. And so Smith concludes his article by saying that God is not dead in academia. He is alive and well and living in his last academic bastion, philosophy departments. So philosophy has really been revolutionized today by this Christian Renaissance. And I would only correct Smith by saying this, I don't think that philosophy is God's last bastion at the university. On the contrary, philosophy is a beachhead at the university from which operations can be launched to impact other areas at the University for Christ. Now, if we've had a renaissance of Christian philosophy today, in one way that indicates to me that we kind of gave that up for a while, because the great philosophers in Christian history, St. Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, and, and, and so forth, were known as these influential philosophers, secular and Christian. Well, what did we do? Did we give it up for a while? Well, what happened was that the Enlightenment occurred in Europe during the 17th and 18th centuries, threw off the monarchy and along with the monarchy, the church, which had become so closely identified with these monarchical forms of government. And so the Enlightenment introduced secularism into society that swept away religion and Christianity along with the monarchy and the old order. And in America in particular, during the 20th century, American evangelicals and Christians began to retreat even more from the university as they separated themselves from these institutions and founded their own Christian colleges and Bible schools. They withdrew from the professional societies into their own little Christian societies and more or less entered into the academic closets of fundamentalism. Now, what was wrong with fundamentalism was not its doctrine, which was largely correct, but it was this kind of cultural isolationism. And we've only begun to reemerge from that during the second half of the 20th century. So in describing this as a renaissance, you're quite right in saying that there was lost ground that needs to be regained. It would seem that Christ never called us to be isolated. No, obviously we're in the world, though not of the world. 
But unfortunately, the kind of separationism that characterized some of the fundamentalist movement sought to separate itself from these institutions as they turned increasingly secular. And as a result, Christianity was marginalized and moved to the fringes of American culture and society. Well, Bill, expound on this some more. What does this renaissance of Christian philosophers in the universities, highly respected, highly respected universities, what does this mean for the church? Well, I think it has tremendous implications for the church because, as I say, the university is the most important institution that shapes our society. And what is a matter of academic debate among the intelligentsia in one generation will trickle down to the man in the street in the next generation and profoundly influence the way we live and think. And therefore, if the university can be influenced for Christ such that Christianity is a viable player at the university, this will help to shape a cultural milieu in which Christianity can still be heard as an intellectually viable option. And that will mean that the gospel can be preached and heard as a serious option, that a person can seriously consider commitment to Christ as something that is a rational thing to do, and it will be tremendously beneficial for the health of Christianity and of the church. The best object lesson to see this is is the negative lesson of Europe. Jan and I lived for 13 years in Europe, and in Europe, because of the Enlightenment, you have a deeply, deeply secular society and a very post-Christian cultural milieu in which Christianity cannot even be heard as a reasonable option for thinking people today. And therefore, you might as well tell university students in Europe to believe in leprechauns as in Jesus Christ, they, they can't even hear you because this has been tried and found wanting. To illustrate, when I was speaking at the University of Porto in Portugal, I gave a talk on evidence for God from science, and the students were so skeptical, they could not believe that I actually had earned doctoral degrees in philosophy and in theology from respected European universities. They didn't believe I was really a visiting researcher at the University of Louvain in Belgium. And so they actually telephoned the University of Louvain to find out if I really was who I said I was. They thought I was an imposter, a charlatan, pretending to be someone I was not because they had never seen a Christian scholar before. In Sweden, when I was speaking there on university campuses, I was shocked to discover that there are no Christian philosophers in Sweden. There is no philosopher in in any faculty department in Sweden who is a self-confessed Christian. It's all secular. And therefore, the gospel is so, so difficult to share with people in these countries because they are so deeply post-Christian and and, uh, do not even regard this as an intellectually viable option. And what you see in Europe can already be seen in Canada. I do a lot of speaking on Canadian campuses. And Canada is is a sort of mid-Atlantic country in that it is much closer to Europe in that sense than the United States. And in the United States, we still have strong vestiges of a Christian cultural milieu in which the gospel can still be heard by most people as a real option for them today. And it's vital that we preserve this, and I think one of the ways in which we do so will be by having Christianity be a respected position which trained and intelligent academic persons can hold to in our various departments at the university. For more resources on this and many other topics from Dr. William Lane Craig, visit online to reasonablefaith.org. That's reasonablefaith.org. Can faith and reason work together, or are they somehow mutually exclusive? What role do facts and evidence play when it comes to the Christian faith? This is Reasonable Faith, Conversations with Dr. William Lane Craig. I'm Kevin Harris, and on behalf of Dr. Craig, I want to welcome you to this discussion as Dr. Craig examines apologetics, reason, faith, and philosophy. 
There has been an amazing renaissance, and it's recent, of Christian philosophers who are very influential in doing terrific work at some of the higher institutions of learning. And, Bill, you've seen this firsthand. Yes, I began to study philosophy of religion really during the late 1960s and 1970s, and it was just about that time that I think the corner was turned and the secularism that had been predominant in American philosophy began to unravel. And over the last 40 years, there has been this tremendous renaissance of Christian philosophy in the Anglo-American realm. What caused this? Well, I think one of the principal causes motivating this renaissance was the collapse of verificationism. Now, verificationism was a philosophy that dominated philosophy and philosophy of science during the first half of the 20th century. And in a nutshell, what verificationism held to was that if you can't verify something with your five senses, then it's meaningless. That would be it in a nutshell. If you can't touch it, smell it, taste it, feel it, or see it, it's meaningless. Well, since you can't verify statements about God, like God loves me or God sent his son into the world, these sorts of statements, theological statements, were regarded as meaningless. They were thought to be combinations of words that was just like baby talk or like gibberish. To say God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life is like saying Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. Just complete <laughs> nonsense. And this theory of meaning dominated philosophy up through the 1930s and 40s, and as a result meant that the whole project of theology, of religious belief, was a meaningless exercise. So this involved a very condescending attitude toward people who believed in God or thought religious language was meaningful. For the cognoscendi, the the intelligentsia who knew better, they could look down on these people as folks who were just uttering gibberish, just meaningless chatter like a chimpanzee, and therefore were disdained and, and, and looked down upon. And what happened was verificationism collapsed during the second half of the 20th century. Somebody found a chink in the armor. I'll say, big time. Somebody found that uh, that principle refutes itself. Well, they did, Kevin. There were two things that were discovered about this verification principle of meaning. First was that it would not only eliminate as meaningless theological statements, but it would also consign to the trash heap of meaningless vast tracts of ordinary language and discourse, such as metaphysical statements, aesthetic statements, and even scientific statements, so that science itself, which was the sacred cow for the verificationists, science itself would be undermined by the verification principle, so that the principle was seen to be wholly unreasonable. It was too restrictive a criterion of meaning because it would make vast, vast stretches of human language and discourse, which we obviously understand, meaningless. But then secondly, as you pointed out, it turned out that the principle was self-refuting. Just ask yourself the question, is the statement, in order to be meaningful, a statement must be verifiable by the five senses? Is that statement verifiable by the five senses? No. Well, no, obviously not. It, it's just a definition, just an arbitrary definition and not even a very good one at that. Now, we can hear an expression of it. We can see it written, but that's not the proposition itself. We can't detect that with the five senses. No, and we can't do any scientific tests. There's nothing you could do in the laboratory, no experiment you could perform to prove that in order to be meaningful, a sentence must be capable of being verified by the five senses. It's so, just an arbitrary definition. And, and therefore, by its own lights, being non-verifiable, it's meaningless. So it turned out that the verification principle, by its own criterion of meaning, is itself a meaningless statement, ah. which hardly needs to detain us. So you're saying the principle of verification failed the principle of verification. Exactly. And so it became... So you can throw it out. Yes, it became very obvious that as a self-refuting principle, this could not be the correct criterion of meaning. Where did that come from? Who was saying that? Who was writing on this? Well, one of the most 
prominent philosophers who was saying this was Antony Flew. Really? Back in 1948, Antony Flew participated in a symposium at Oxford University called Theology and Falsification, in which he argued that statements about God were incapable of being falsified. That was a sort of mirror image of verification, falsification, and therefore theological statements are meaningless. And Flu created a huge hubbub back in the late 40s and 1950s because of his defense of this falsification principle and his claim that theological language is meaningless. Now, at this recording, Antony Flew has moved away from atheism. This is just one of the manifestations of this renaissance that I'm talking about, is that now this man, who as far back as 1948, think of the influence he has had, uh, has been a prominent atheistic philosopher, now within the last uh, couple of years, uh, said that he is now a theist and believes on the basis of the evidence that there is a designer of the universe who is beyond the universe and who has designed it and brought it into being. So Professor Anthony Flew is one manifestation of this. What are some other manifestations? Well, some of the other manifestations would be the founding of a number of societies which are devoted to the propagation of Christian philosophy. For example, the Society of Christian Philosophers, which now has hundreds, uh, if not thousands, of members in it, as well as the Evangelical Philosophical Society, which is relatively recent and is the only society of philosophers in the world which is devoted to explicitly evangelical points of view on philosophy. I'm currently serving as the president of the Evangelical Philosophical Society, and our journal, Philosophia Christi, has now become one of the leading journals in philosophy of religion in the world, and our society is now one of the largest societies of philosophy of religion in the world, and it is explicitly and confessionally evangelical. This would just be one manifestation of this Renaissance. In addition to this, there would be the founding of numerous other journals for the study of philosophy of religion. Journals like Religious Studies, the International Journal for Philosophy of Religion, Sophia, and so forth. Many professional journals now are devoted to the integration of philosophy and religion. And this has caused tremendous resurgence of interest in university campuses for courses in philosophy of religion. And so students are clamoring for courses on this subject, and this has in turn evoked a flood of textbooks in philosophy of religion. Almost every major textbook publisher now is putting out a textbook in philosophy of religion. For example, Rutgers University Press, very liberal Eastern Press, contacted me and said, would you please edit for us a book of readings on philosophy of religion that could be a textbook at universities for courses on this subject. And so I said, you bet I will. <laughs> and I put together a very evangelical collection of first-rate work in philosophy of religion that is virtually all from a Christian perspective, defending the existence of God, answering the problem of evil, explaining the coherence of theism, defending the Trinity and incarnation. And after I had submitted this to them, I said to the editors at Rutgers University Press, uh, you know, this collection that I've put together for you is uh, very conservative. And they said, yes, we know. That's why we wanted it. Mm. And I was just astonished that people want this kind of evangelical work. In fact, if you look at Oxford University Press's current catalog of offerings, there are far more books now published by Oxford University Press on philosophy of religion than in metaphysics, epistemology, philosophy of science. It is philosophy of religion. And many of those books are written by conservative Christians. Oxford University Press is now starting to publish books on Christian apologetics. Can you, you know, imagine that? Bill, this is such good news. And one thing that should be pointed out is that although the university is discovering these things, you still run into this on the street among lay people and uh, freshmen oh. in college. They'll, they'll say, if I can't see it, taste it, hear it, smell it, and so forth, then it must not be real. 
Yes, and they don't understand that that kind of verificationism has been out the window since uh, the late 1950s, early 1960s. They say, show it to me empirically, or I can test it with my five senses, and then I'll believe it. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's remarkable. Like and I, I must say, too, that this revolution has yet to filter down to the man in the street. It's going to. It's starting to. I think, if I may say, one of the indications of this filtering down is that as I speak around the country, I find everywhere grassroots interest in Christian apologetics rising up among Christian laymen. People want to know about these things on the lay level. And that is a manifestation, I think, that this revolution is beginning to impact and will reshape American culture and society. For more resources on this and many other topics from Dr. William Lane Craig, visit online to reasonablefaith.org. That's reasonablefaith.org. Can faith and reason work together, or are they somehow mutually exclusive? What role do facts and evidence play when it comes to the Christian faith? This is Reasonable Faith, Conversations with Dr. William Lane Craig. I'm Kevin Harris, and on behalf of Dr. Craig, I want to welcome you to this discussion as Dr. Craig examines apologetics, reason, faith, and philosophy. If you've been listening to this program, you know that apologetics is that branch of theology that defends the Christian faith, that gives reasons for why we believe what we believe. And Dr. Craig, there's just been an explosion of Christian apologetics. Oh, in recent decades, it's been a transformation that's been going on. It is so exciting. The renaissance in Christian philosophy that is going on at the university is being paralleled by a renaissance of Christian apologetics at the same time, on a popular level as well as on a scholarly level. The lay people are beginning to discover this field and also see that it's very necessary to reach this culture for Christ. I think that's right. Lay people are finding this. When I first began speaking on American university campuses, I was something of an anomaly, and people didn't really know what apologetics is. They hadn't ever heard of defending the faith rationally. But now I find when I travel that everywhere I go, there are these little apologetics groups springing up in churches and on campuses where people are reading books together and studying issues together of apologetic importance. And there's tremendous grassroots interest in the churches and on the university campuses among Christians in learning how to commend their faith rationally. There's nothing new about this. I mean, the early church fathers had to do this. That's true. The early church fathers, there was a group of them that were known as the Christian apologists, people like Justin Martyr and Tatian and Athenagoras and so forth. And apologetics has characterized the church down through its history. But among evangelicals during the 20th century, We reached a very low ebb during the 1920s and 30s and 40s in which there were virtually no Christian apologetics being written. And E.J. Carnell's book in 1948, An Introduction to Christian Apologetics, was like a, a rock far out at sea, the first indication that something new was coming on the horizon. And uh, in the years since Uh, 1948, we've seen a growing tide of interest in uh, philosophy of religion and in Christian apologetics that is now uh, just of enormous proportions. It's such a rich field. It involves philosophy, theology, history, archaeology, science, and so many different areas, literature. That's exactly right. It is tremendously rich. You'll have, for example, Christian apologists who specialize in the area of philosophy. That's my area, for example, or a a J.P. Moreland or a Doug Guyvett, for example. But then you have other Christian apologists who are working in the sciences, people like uh, Hugh Ross or William Dembski or Michael Behe or Stephen Meyer. And then others will be working in the area of historical apologetics, people like Gary Habermas or N.T. Wright, uh, Daryl Bach, Craig Evans, uh, Craig Blomberg, 
um, uh, Ben Witherington, and so forth. So it's a, it's a wide ranging field with many areas of specialization. What I've noticed is that a lot of people in the church started studying apologetics as a hobby and discovered the importance of the field and how necessary it is, and that the Bible actually tells us to engage in apologetics, 1 Peter 3.15. Right. That says that every one of us should be prepared to give a defense to anyone who asks us a reason for the hope that is within us. And Christians are beginning to discover the importance of being able to do that. I think that the increasing secularization of our society, and especially of our high schools, has motivated people in a, as never before to begin to study apologetics so that they can give a reason to their non-Christian friends and to be able to stand up in class to their non-Christian professors and not look like an idiot, frankly, for believing in Christianity and in the Bible. So the increasing secularization in American society, I think, helps to evoke this sense of need among Christian parents and among Christian teenagers in getting trained in this discipline. Bill, we were just not taught to do this growing up in the church so often. Uh, in the 70s when I was growing up, and I attended all the large youth movement gatherings and everything, and we just weren't taught this area. Not yeah. until Josh McDowell came along with his book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, and so many of us, a light went off in our heads. Yes. Josh had a real influence on my life, too. I went to four years at Wheaton College, and although I studied Old and New Testament and systematic theology, I was never trained in being able to commend the historicity of the New Testament text. I was surprised that I was never taught this by my professors. And it wasn't until I read Josh McDowell that I realized that one could give historically credible reasons for thinking that the New Testament is reliable and uh, an authentic record of the deeds and words of Jesus of Nazareth, including his radical claims, his miracles, and his resurrection. So I think Josh had a tremendous influence in evoking the interest in the historicity of the New Testament text among many of us. Other important early figures would have been C.S. Lewis, for example, though not a philosopher himself, C.S. Lewis helped to spark interest in Christian philosophy among many people. Francis Schaeffer, as well, was a, a man who had a deep influence on me and on many others. I think that although people like Lewis and Schaeffer were not themselves great philosophers, they helped to evoke a generation of philosophers who would stand on their shoulders and do even better work, the work that they themselves could not do, and uh, thereby helped to spark this renaissance of interest in Christian philosophy and in Christian apologetics. In the 1980s, it seems that people began to discover Norman Geisler's popular work. Geisler has also had a tremendous influence. He's been around for a long time. I recently spoke with him at the meeting of the Evangelical Philosophical Society, and he told me that when he first began to do apologetics, he said there was virtually nothing written in the field of apologetics. If you wanted to read a book on apologetics, you had to get something by Gordon Clark or maybe a book by Cornelius Van Til. But he said that was all there was. There was nothing else to read. And now, of course, we are just suffused with books on Christian apologetics. They're just everywhere. It, the, the difference between the 1940s and where we are today in the 21st century is just like night and day. And Norm deserves a good bit of the credit for having trained a good number of us. I was his pupil. Uh, and having inspired many others who did not study under him but who read his work and uh, as a result have gone on in the field themselves. In fact, if I may say, just this past year, Frank Beckwith and J.P. Moreland and I edited a collection in honor of Norman Geisler called To Everyone an Answer, which is published by InterVarsity Press, and it was a fest schrift or a celebratory a volume in honor of the life and work of Norman Geisler, and it's a collection of essays on apologetics by many of us who appreciate the example that he set. Now, for so long, apologetics was characterized as going to the cults, 
going to non-Christian religions, addressing the beliefs of the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons from a, an orthodox historic position. And that was what apologetics were. And Dr. Walter Martin was like the only one doing it. it I remember like. that back in the 60s, uh, Walter Martin's Kingdom of the Cults was the book that you would read to deal with people in other cults. And many people thought that's what apologetics is, is arguing with cults. Well, in fact, there's a far, far graver menace to Christianity than the cults, and that is secularism, just the increasing dominating secularism that has dominated Europe for centuries, that has increasingly taken over Canada during the 20th century, and that is encroaching upon American public life as well. And this is the primary enemy that we as Christians need to be addressing, not simply Christian cults. Well, that enemy seemed to have snuck up on us in a sense, because there was a time when we would only deal with the cults and our apologetics and our thinking and so forth, and all the seminars dealt with that, and we just blew off the atheist. We just wrote them off and said, hey, you're an atheist, you're beyond hope, and didn't deal with that segment. I think that's right, Kevin. Uh, For some reason, that was part of this intellectual retreat into these closets of fundamentalism that I've referred to on other occasions where Christians separated themselves from the academy and the university and from the public square and went into their own little Bible colleges and Bible societies and their Christian publishers didn't publish with non-Christian presses but only wrote books for Christians with Christian presses. And as a result, we're not engaging the increasingly secular society in which we live. Bill, would you agree with me that doing apologetics and the work of apologetics is a very loving thing to do? It's not about beating people up with your arguments. Not at all, Kevin. It's, it's respecting the unbeliever when the unbeliever has questions or objections. It's saying, you deserve to be taken seriously. And because I take you seriously, I'm going to do my best to answer your questions and your objections and to commend my Christian faith to you as the most rational thing that you can do. For more resources on this and many other topics from Dr. William Lane Craig, visit online to reasonablefaith.org. That's reasonablefaith.org. Can faith and reason work together, or are they somehow mutually exclusive? What role do facts and evidence play when it comes to the Christian faith? This is Reasonable Faith, Conversations with Dr. William Lane Craig. I'm Kevin Harris, and on behalf of Dr. Craig, I want to welcome you to this discussion as Dr. Craig examines apologetics, reason, faith, and philosophy. There have been a series of books recently that have had a huge impact on society at large and on the Christian church. And Dr. Craig, you are involved in those three books. In fact, you're interviewed in those three books by Lee Strobel, The Case for Christ, The Case for Faith, and The Case for a Creator. That's right, Kevin. Lee did come to Atlanta and interview me for all three of those. I first got to know Lee Strobel back uh, when he was a minister at Willow Creek Community Church, and he and Mark Middleberg sponsored a huge debate at Willow Creek between myself and Frank Zindler from the American Atheists Organization. How many came to that debate? That was funny. When they held it, Bill Hybels, the pastor, said to them, Mark and Lee, you're going to be lucky if you get 300 people come to this. Nobody's interested in this kind of intellectual stuff. Well, that afternoon, around 4 o'clock, buses began (laughs) pouring into the parking lot. When they opened the doors, the main auditorium, which seats 5,000, filled in 30 seconds. People were running down the aisles to find a seat. It overflowed into the chapel, into the gymnasium. At the end, they had just under 8,000 people attend that debate. 
at Willow Creek. It was the largest indoor event they ever had. And it was broadcast live over the Moody Radio Network at the same time. So it was a tremendous event that reached thousands of people. Bill, many people discovered you by watching that debate on video, and it's still available. It is still available. Uh, Zondervan puts it out, and Lee and Mark said to me that they hoped that this would be something that would be a help to my own ministry as a Christian philosopher and theologian. And it certainly has been, as many people, even in other countries, have seen this debate with Frank Sindler. And then Lee Strobel's books that you mentioned have also been a great benefit to me because folks read those books and then they come to discover my work and then will come and hear me speak on a campus or read something I've written. I even had my uh, next door neighbor come up to me while I was out weeding in the front yard and say to me, Bill, are, are, you, are you William Lane Craig? <laughs> and I said, yes, I have. And he said, I've been reading The Case for Christ. I didn't know that was you. And so it's, it's funny how people have gotten to know me through reading Lee's books. Well, you're an overnight success for 20 years in the making. You know. <laughs> Again, these books are a good starting point for a lot of people to begin to study. And these books are also a a part of the apologetics renaissance that we've been talking about. We are seeing a renaissance in apologetics. Back in the late 1940s, you could find practically nothing written on Christian apologetics, virtually no books at all. And now we are just uh, suffused with fine books on apologetics, and Lee's are just three of them that I think are very good books. They're at an introductory level. They're easy to read. But nevertheless, they're based on interviews with really top people, and the material, though simplified, is solid. So I commend Lee's books to any of our listeners that are beginners and would like to begin to understand how to defend their faith. Apologetics seems to do a couple of things. It strengthens the faith of the believer in their appreciation and wonder and awe at a mighty God. And it also helps those who may have roadblocks to faith come to know Christ. It does both of those things. In the life of the believer, there are often times when our spiritual life is not as vital as we would like it to be. Uh, There are times of spiritual dryness or the dark valley. And during those times when the witness of the Holy Spirit in our hearts may seem eclipsed or muted, it's nice to know that there are good reasons and arguments for believing what we believe, that there is a personal God who created the world and has revealed himself in Christ. And then, of course, as we share our faith with an increasingly secular culture, we need to be prepared to give reasons for why we believe what we believe. Otherwise, people will simply dismiss us by saying, well, that's nice for you, but it's not true for me. We need to have objective evidence and arguments to support our faith. What can we do to encourage and continue this renaissance, this explosion of apologetics and interest in this area? There are a number of things that I would like to see folks do. One thing I would like to see happen is I would like to see churches establish scholarship funds for high school graduates or college graduates in their uh, churches to attend schools where they can get this kind of training. We need to treat this as seriously as we treat candidates for the mission field and have student scholarships uh, that they would be interviewed for and make application for so that they could go to seminary and study at a place like Talbot School of Theology and uh, get a degree in philosophy of religion or Christian apologetics. In the same way, I would like to see people open their pocketbooks and begin to give to these institutions that do offer these programs. I'm connected with Talbot, where we have the largest MA program in philosophy of religion in the English-speaking world, and also a huge program in Christian apologetics. And there are many international students that would like to attend. We get students applying from China and Ethiopia and Sweden and other countries who would like to attend but many times lack the funds. And these kids need scholarship money. And one of the things that Jan and I do with our own personal Lord's money, our own giving, is we contribute to student scholarship funds to help fund these students who can't afford it to come and do these programs, and then they'll go back to their countries and be an influence for Christ there. For example, there's a fellow now at Talbot from Ethiopia 
who is, he, he was dirt poor. I mean, he didn't even have the clothes to come to America, much less the payment for tuition and books and so forth. But we, that is to say, the school and other Christian philosophers helped to fund him. And when he goes back to Ethiopia, he is guaranteed a position as a professor of philosophy at the university in Addis Ababa, and he will be one of three philosophers in the entire country and will be defending on teaching philosophy from an explicitly evangelical point of view. This is the kind of person that we need to rally behind and get behind in a tangible way. So I would like to see people give to programs like that. I would also like to see people become members of the Evangelical Philosophical Society. This is the largest society of Christian philosophers in the world. It is the only society of Christian philosophers which is dedicated to doing philosophy from an an evangelical point of view. And uh, lay people can subscribe or, or join the society as associate members. And when they do so, they will sus- receive a subscription to our journal, Philosophia Christi, which is one of the finest journals in philosophy of religion that is out there today. And by joining the society and contributing their dues, which is about $30 a year, this can help to fuel and fund this movement in Christian philosophy and apologetics that is going on. So those are some practical ways that I think people can encourage this movement and see it go forward. Now, of course, in their own lives, I would like to see Christian parents begin to teach this, these kinds of arguments and evidence to their own children. I think that parents of high schoolers ought to send them to a summer camp with Summit Christian Ministries, where these high school students will get worldview training to prepare them for college education and will be trained by top Christian philosophers and apologetics. They're doing a terrific work with uh, Summit Christian Ministries. I also think that we ought to encourage students to enroll in programs such as those that I've mentioned at Talbot School of Theology, at Denver Seminary, Liberty University, uh, Bethel Seminary, where good work on Christian apologetics is being done. We need more people to catch a vision of becoming a Christian apologist and want to enter into this in a a vocational way. Well, equipping yourself in this area just helps one become a good ambassador for Christ, an effective ambassador. What kind of ambassador for Christ do you want to be, a good one or a bad one? (laughs) Exactly. And so this isn't just for people who go into this full time. I've been talking about the movement of professional Christian apologists and those who are receiving training in this area, but every lay person can benefit from this. And so I would encourage people to get into discussion groups where you will read through, for example, the case for Christ or reasonable faith, and do the study questions as you go through it and discuss it amongst yourself. And then after you finish that book, graduate to another book and be involved in this kind of way in stimulating each other intellectually and uh, mentally to wrestle with these issues. You will become a deeper more interesting, more well-rounded person as a result of that kind of interaction. And of course, I think our churches need to offer Sunday school classes in this. We need to quit having adult Sunday school classes which simply offer simpering devotional lessons week after week and get serious about educating our adults. We need to have classes in church history, classes in New Testament and Old Testament contents, in systematic theology and doctrine, and in Christian apologetics. I would say we even ought to offer classes in New Testament Greek. So the Sunday school classes are something that we need Christian education ministers to get a vision for and to really transform into giving our lay people serious apologetics. They deserve no less. For more resources on this and many other topics from Dr. William Lane Craig, visit online to reasonablefaith.org. That's reasonablefaith.org.